Today we're going to talk about my plumbing class, my plumbing lab class so far. And unfortunately, since I'm taking the summer quarter for my trade school, maybe that's the reason why, but we have not had very many lab opportunities. Basically meaning we've had a lot of lectures sitting down, looking at the board, listening to the teacher talk and taking information, getting handouts on different parts of um, plumbing related fixtures. And um, we haven't had the opportunity to go into the lab and really look at the actual fixtures um, hands on and install things, even though the water is not running in most instances, we have not really had that much of an opportunity to do that. And I think it's because it's summer, so I feel like instructors take a lot of vacation during this time, and that's probably the reason why we haven't been able to, that's sugar snoring, we haven't been able to really experience a lot of hands-on learning. But regardless, what we have done so far, in the last video, I explained how we had installed an actual physical two-piece toilet onto the wax ring, the onto the, the flange that's already connected to, that sits on top of the drain pipe where all the number twos and number ones go. So we, tackled next how to install and adjust the water level on a refill valve and basically a refill valve aka ball cock sits on the if you look at the toilet face front like the seat is in front of you and the, the handle is on your left the ball cock is the contraption on the left side where it connects to the like the little handle that's sitting outside and it has like a little wire or a little plastic um, adjustable stick. I, I'm trying to explain it in layman's terms. <laughs> um, so we learn how to adjust the water level on that. So it needs to pull 1.28 gallons per minute or per flush or um, some toilets still say 1.6 gallons per flush. So you need to figure out how many gallons it's supposed to pull and that's usually on the bowl or it's usually underneath the tank lid. So I believe the one that we had for our group was 1.28 gallons per flush and we calculated that to how many pounds of water because we had a scale and we had a bucket and we teared the weight of the bucket, used the scale and we calculated that it was supposed to pull about 15.34 pounds or something like that. And so together with the weight of the bucket that we were using, so we did that and basically an opportunity to learn how to adjust the water level. So use the hush tube on the ball cock and you actually use a flat screwdriver because it's basically, if you look at it from a bird's eye view, it's like a circle and a little uh, line that's um, indented in there and so you stick a flat screwdriver in there and if you turn it to the right it will increase the water if you turn it to the left it will decrease the amount of water that it will take to flush. The contraption on the left side of the tank with that is black and red that is the fill valve or refill valve and then the contraption on the right side of the tank is called the Douglas fir, uh, Douglas, fir, Douglas valve or the flush valve. So we used a bucket to measure the weight of the water coming out to make sure that the toilet was pulling 1.6 gallons per flush or 1.28, whatever the manufacturer's label said. Um, and then after that, we took out everything. We turned off the water. There's an actual angle stuff underneath to turn off water in the designated toilets that's in the laboratory at school. And then we had the instructor take the ball cock and he just pretty much kind of moved things around like things are adjustable on the ball cock so after that we had to reinstall the ball cock and basically you want to um there's a lot of putting on clipping on but the main which is i feel like pretty self-explanatory for the most part but the main thing that I feel like most people won't just be able to DIY is adjusting the critical level 
and the water level inside the tank so that the water that's filling up inside the tank does not overfill. Basically so that the water level won't surpass the refill tube, won't surpass the overflow tube, and you're not going to have a tank that's going to continue to fill up and then overflow over your tank. So we learned how to do that. And then as with the Douglas valve, basically how to install it is kind of hand in hand with installing the tank of the uh, tank of the toilet. And then, so you unscrew some things and basically it's, it's just like a little rubber connector basically that it sits on. And then as for the flapper that is on the Douglas valve, there are little clip-ons clip on part on the flapper called ears and basically you just hook and unhook to replace and install. Next part of the class we learned about the water heater, just the anatomy of a water heater, how it really works and water, cold water goes into the hot water or cold, cold water goes into the water heater from the bottom of the dip tube and the fire, the burner at the bottom of the heater warms it up and the hot water travels up and it goes out to the hot water outgoing pipe. So we learn all of that but the installation of that will likely be much more than $500, like $1,000. Actually maybe like $2,000. So I'm not going to do that. Also I don't, I can't carry a water heater. Obviously, you can't carry a water heater with the water in it because that's like over 200 pounds. Well, maybe even 300 pounds, like depending on how many gallons a water heater ho holds. It could be 30, 40, or 50. So I'm not going to do that for my business anyway. So I'm not going to go into the describing everything. Um, but we did learn about that. And then next, we learned about the kitchen sink and the obviously anatomy of a kitchen sink. We learned how to install a disposal. In class we call it a disposer where you have the mounting of a food disposal up at the top. You put the little the first little ring from the top and you put a putty so it is a water sealant so that water as you're using the sink doesn't seep through and then leak all over. So you're going to put a put putty squeeze the little top of it in and then from the bottom screw in the three screws of the mount together and then you're also going to install a snap ring basically holding the mounting together so the mounting has like different ridges so that as you're connecting the different pieces of the mounting there's like three layers of the mounting basically this when you attach the snap ring it will hold the mounting up and then you're going to basically hook and latch the actual disposer. So usually like a black um, stainless steel or cast iron, cast iron made disposer. And inside the disposer are mashers and basically there's a bottom plate in the disposer and that kind of twists and turns moving the mashers on the side of the disposer to grind up the food. Yeah. So we installed the disposer, which was really cool. And then we learned about what um, what needs to be installed within one of the holes of the, of the sink. If you have a dishwasher, which I always wondered what that little thing was. Like this tiny little, not right next to the kitchen faucet. And I didn't, there was like a little hole in it. And I was like, what is that? Now I know what it is. It's called an air gap. And the hose underneath the air gap must connect directly to the dishwasher, which is a 5 8 of an inch pipe, a plastic pipe. And that makes sure that the water from the dishwasher, the dirty water from the dishwasher does not go into the clean water. And then if you look underneath your air gap, there's actually two plastic tubes going. So one 5 8 pipe going to the dishwasher drain and then the 7 8 dishwasher uh, tube going into the, or air gap dishwasher tube going into the disposer. So that if 
I guess if there's any debris coming from the dishwasher, it'll go into the disposer to decompose and not decompose, but to be grinded up and into the drain. So we learned about that. We learned about, you know, different code regulations for the trap arm on the kitchen sink and just a lot of the logistics and terminology. And then we are currently learning about bathtubs and shower stalls. And I've come to realize that a lot of the shot, I think this is why we see so many different kinds of, you know, really nice shower heads, really big shower stalls. Uh, the McMansions here in LA have all kinds of beautiful looking, innovative, creative looking bathtubs and shower stalls because there really isn't code for the measurements of a bathtub. So it could be, there's five different styles of a bathtub and that is one, a built-in, which is what I have in my apartment. It just kind of like seals into the wall. You can't like move it around. There's no gap around it. It's just stuck in the wall, so it's built in. And then um, the next one is freestanding. So basically, it usually like sits on four legs. And I feel like in a lot of old movies, you would see it. It's like this beautiful white tub and it's sitting on its own. A lot of scary movies have that too, I feel. And then the next one is Whirlpool. And that's basically like a jacuzzi, you know, outside. Um, and then we have soaking which is like a Japanese tub where instead of the depth of the um, bathtub being like, what is a normal depth? I don't remember, like 14 inches or 16 inches. It's like 22 inches because I know this from personal experience. My bathtubs in Japan were so much deeper because we always take baths. And then the last one is specialty style and that's typically for the ADA um, you know people with disabilities need a specific height or depth uh, bathtub or even height you know or things installed in them so that, those are the five styles so we're learning about that and I think we're pretty much done we are going to have a lab today so I will have another video talking about the next thing we do in lab for my plumbing class so I guess that's it for this video for this plumbing class Thank you so much for watching. Honestly, not a lot of people are watching my videos. Even my friends and family, I feel like, aren't watching my videos. But at the end of the day, I have to be very clear about the purpose of these videos, which is holding myself accountable, really learning and taking in everything that I'm, you know, being exposed to in school and kind of getting a feel for, okay, what am I going to be able to do for my business? Um, what are some of the kinds of things that I'm able to do and I actually like and from a consumer's point of view what are some of the things that I could educate people while I'm um, servicing them or what are some of the things that most comp consumers would never touch and I could be that helping hand not helping hand I'm obviously gonna charge them and make a profit but you know I'm getting a lot of that in in the learning process while I'm in tree school and I'd like to say so far I didn't think this would happen but the plumbing things like the plumbing aspect is very interesting like carpentry is great and you know like hammering the wood unpopular opinion I feel like it's a lot more messy yet meticulous than plumbing I feel like plumbing is more fun and simple at the same time but I get the I guess there's more risk involved because if you don't turn on the water turn off the water or you don't um, protect yourself properly because there's a lot of you know exposure to bacteria and things underground and th venting into the roof so that you don't have odor inside the house all these kinds of things I've just been able to learn surface level of it so I guess along the way, I'll have to decide if I want to continue to solidify a specific genre of knowledge. But right now, if I have to compare the two, I really enjoy um, the doing of the plumbing 
a little bit more than the carpentry. But anyway, that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. Subscribe. I post videos every Tuesday and Sunday, if not at least once a week. Okay.